innovation in uh, spin, spin systems. So uh, thanks, uh, Santiago, take the lead. Grazie. Okay, this is work done with Alessandro Laio at CISA. And uh, here's a, a little introduction to intrinsic dimension. You can hear me correctly? Uh, I have this one. Um, so this is an example of uh, uncorrelated data in uh, continuous R3. So the lack of correlations makes data occupy all the space. But it's usually the case that correlations make data be uniformly distributed in some, in some manifold that has a particular dimension here, in this case, two, uh, which can be lower and possibly much lower than the full embedding dimension of the space. And so this particular manifold is um, curved, but it can be also topologically non-trivial. But the, the, the thing, important thing here is that the intrinsic dimension is smaller than the full embedding dimension, in this case, three. This is another feature of the intrinsic dimension. So if you look very close, if you zoom in too much, you might see that your data is uh, approximately two-dimensional, but actually, if you zoom out, then you see that actually your data is uh, in a line, right? So the, the intrinsic dimension at large scales, it's one here, but at short scales, might, might seem like two. Okay, I'm going to speak about a so-called binomial estimator to, to be able to estimate this intrinsic dimension from data, and I'm going to uh, first introduce this paper developed in the group um, recently, and then we are going to generalize this paper. But in order to estimate the intrinsic dimension, we have the following setup. So we are going to assume in a generic domain D that our points are uniformly distributed, but we don't say which D we have. We are going to say, um, take a set A in this domain, and we are going to assume that we can assign a volume to this set. And the, the strongest assumption or setup is that we are going to say that the probability of finding n a points in a is a Poisson distribution with mu equal to rho times v a. So in this sense, rho is the density, right? Because it's the average uh, number of points over the volume. And so with this setup, we are going to um, see how we can estimate the intrinsic dimension without knowing rho. And so, I would like to, I see, I would like to use the board a little bit. So, so given this Poisson distribution, we are, go, we are going to consider actually the probability of observing n a points in a conditioned on observing n b points in b. And I'm going to say what is a and b, no? So given a point in your data set, we are going to take a ball of radius uh, r a and another ball of radius r b in this, in this point from the data set. So I is in A, that is a subset of B. And so we are going to compute this uh, conditional probability. And uh, we can write it like this. So we are going to write the joint over the marginal, but we are writing this. P of NA in A times the probability of having NB minus NA in B minus A. Because if the sets are not overlapping by construction, uh, then the, the probability factorizes. The two random variables are independent. And just the marginal below, P of NB in B. And so this is Poisson, this is Poisson, this is Poisson. And our hypothesis will be that that row is constant and it's constant throughout all the external ball, let's say. And so rho is the same in A and B in such a way that when you simplify everything, then you just get 
MB binomial NA, uh, P to the NA, 1 minus P to the NB minus NA. So this conditional probability, it's binomial. That's why the, the name of the estimator, where P is just VA over BB, and rho doesn't appear in, all, in any place. And so, given this, this is what I just said, just in case. So we are going to consider maximum likelihood estimation setup, uh, the usual case, so having NS independent observations. And so the likelihood like this will be factorized, so all the binomials for every, for every data, uh, data point. And if we do maximum likelihood estimation, then we are going to arrive to this formula, eight, this equation eight, which actually has a very nice interpretation. So the interpretation is as follows. Whenever you see in your data set that this quantity, this expectation value of the number of points in the set A that you can uh, measure or you can estimate from your data set counting how many points are at the, at the given uh, inside the ball for a given radius. Then you count and you estimate this, you count and you estimate this, and whenever the ratio between the two expectation values matches the ratio of two volumes with the corresponding radii in some d hat, then your data set is uniformly distributed in a d hat dimensional space, which is kind of the interpretation of this equation. See? So what is the I index on the left-hand side of six, and what is the little d uh, with respect to which you take the derivative in seven? Good, the little d without the hat is the true intrinsic dimension. The hat is the estimator of that. And the I, it's the index of each data point. In on the, the left, there should be no I, no I, right? Or it's a big, okay, it's, it's the ensemble of, uh, uh, so I'm slightly confused. The yes, yes, uh, uh, sorry. Yes, you, could, you can put packets, for example, depends on all the N, A, I. But so one sample is, uh, is a set of points or it's one point here? Uh, one sample, it's a, okay. yes. Okay. Yes, you have your data set, and you pick one, this, this point, you take a ball, and you count how many are there. Okay. But this is point I. Okay? Uh, please interrupt me if there are any more questions. Through the volume, into the function L, Exactly. L depends on uh, the volumes, and the volumes are taken in some domain D, uh, D, D mathcal D, and so uh, here you have inside the D. But we, this is completely generic, so we are not taking any space in particular for the moment. We are going to choose that later. So, in particular, if your data is real valued and it's in RD, then the volume that you have to choose is the, the, the volume of a sphere in RD that is proportional to R to the D. And the omega is just the integral of, of the angle, just that. But we are going to work with spin systems, so we want to deal with discrete variables. So if you have variables that are in Z to the D, then actually you cannot use, you shouldn't use this volume. You should use a volume uh, that basically counts how many points are in a given set in Z to the D. And so this is an expression that goes by the name of Erhard theory of polytopes. It comes from there. I'm not going to justify it, but I'm going to explain 
why there is a diamond there, just to understand a bit what we are doing. So we are going to stick to the case in which we are working in Z2. And so we have a data point, a, a point in the lattice. This is just for the space. This, this is a geometrical argument. So we have a point, and we have to define volumes in this place. And so the volume will be the number of points in the set. And so the number of points at distance uh, r equal to zero is just one. Let me put it here. But at distance one, you have these four points. And at distance two, you have, using the L1 metric, in Z2, you have all these points. Well, this one. Because the distance two is the graph distance, let's say, the, or the L1 distance is not this one. And so the number of points at distance one is four, the number of points at distance two is eight, if you count them, and the volume for a ball in this place with radius two is uh, 13. So if you put these numbers in, in that equation, you, you get a 13. Is this clear? Good. Then the last piece of theory that I'll introduce before the sum results is the following, what they called uh, model validation. So we're claiming that given our set of hypotheses, our construction, uh, these conditionals are binomials, okay? But we have data and eventually we can uh, count and make a, make a take the empirical probability of NA in A, just counting in every point, and take the, we, we can estimate the empirical probability of NB in B, the external ball, and if, um, if everything is correct, then we should see that these two quantities are equal in equal to equation 12, so this empirical probability should be the sum of all the, the conditionals. This is the law of total probability. And if we don't see an agreement between the two sizes computed in the data, then we have a problem. And so this is the first test, test that they did uh, using this estimator in the simplest possible case, which is a, a uniform density data set. Uh, and they saw the following. So they worked with two variables on the left, just two variables taking values between uh, zero and 50. So the configuration space, let's say it's a plane or a chunk of a plane or 50 by 50. But they took periodic boundary conditions to avoid uh, edge effects as much as possible. And they see that this orange line, it's a, a perfect two. So they, they get the correct number in this case using this algorithm. And they check that actually, if they compute the cumulative distribu distribution function of the number of counts, then they, say they see a good agreement between the empirical, that is orange here below, and what they called N model, which is the sum of the binomials. So um, everything seems under control. You get a two and you see that these two curves are um, exactly equal. They do the same in a slightly more different case, which is equal to six, but it's exactly the same. Now the data, it's uniformly distributed in a solid cube, in a solid discrete cube in six dimensions with periodic boundary conditions. And uh, again, they get the correct number. But a less trivial example can be the following. So here they take fractals, a chunk of a fractal. This is called Koch curve and this is called the Sierpinski triangle. And so these fractals are continuous. They are constructed with continuous variables, but they basically take an image, so they discretize the fractals. And um, then basically they can use this algorithm, which is meant for discrete uh, variables if we, if we pick this, uh, this setup, right? So they wanted to see if the, if the algorithm can handle fractal dimensions, and it can, 
eventually, when you enlarge the scale as much as possible, where scale here means the external radius, right? Uh, that tells you which, what is the scale in which you are seeing the system or the data. See? Exactly. Yes, the scale is the radius of the external ball. And so if your balls are too small, then you can see, so that means zooming too much, then you see that the data is more or less two-dimensional because of the wiggling of the, of the curve, if you look this one. And if you make the scale longer, then you start to see the, the true dimension of the system, that it's uh, this, this quantity. Okay, any questions? Yes, it is. Fractal dimension. Just they compared it uh, to know, uh, to see the similarities or not between the algorithms. But this is what they did. So, no, 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 because it's not a curve. It, it is called Koch curve, but it's a fractal. No, never, 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 because it's not a curve. Exactly. Um, perfect. So what we want to do and what we did is study the intrinsic dimension in uh, spin systems. So we are going to consider uh, this, this lattice in particular, the honeycomb lattice is completely relevant for the results. Um, we are going to put binary variables in each one of the vertex and we are going to take the energy to be uh, the first neighbor's anti-ferromagnetic coupling, it's called, so here there is a plus, and so the variables want to be exactly opposed to its uh, neighbors. So every spin wants to be opposite to its neighbors. And we are going to consider just a standard setup, the equilibrium probabilities, so the probability of having a particular configuration sigma bold symbol is uh, just this one, the Boltzmann weight. So the exponential of minus beta energy, where beta is the inverse temperature. And uh, we know for this system that at, um, in the thermodynamic limit, there is a second order transition between a disordered phase and an ordered phase. Um, and the transition is characterized by um, exponentially um, power law, two point correlation function, uh, scale invariance, so it is a very well-known transition. Uh, and in particular, our simulations will be just for 2,000 spins, which is a, a pretty small system, but. Yes. Yes, because it, it's not frustrated. If you just make um, a plot of the lattice, you can perfectly put an antiferromagnetic state without any problem. So here is plus one, minus one, minus one, plus one, minus one. And when you close the cycle, then it, it's again. Ah, see, see. Now, if you sum all the spins, you get zero. But it's the magnetization in sublattice A minus the other. Because in sublattice A is the left, and so if you sum all the lefts, they are all up, and all the others are all down in this step, and so this is plus or minus one. You have two ground states. Uh, that's the Z2 symmetry of that Hamiltonian. So this is our system. But we want to use this algorithm that works with the distances, so what we have to do is compute all the distances between all our configurations. We did that. And this is the first thing that you have to see in order to choose the scale. Because nobody tells you at which scale you have to look at the system. But if you compute the distances, I have to explain first what, the, what k is. So these are the empirical probabilities, so the histogram uh, of the distances, the distances between configurations, uh, so if you have just three spins, and this is one, zero, one, 
and this is one, one zero, the distance is uh, two, okay? This is the distance in configuration space that has nothing, nothing to do with the distance in, in the real space of the lattice. That is irrelevant for the moment. But this K that I am defining there, it's the following. So we have the whole system and we want to look just um, a chunk of the system. A chunk defined by a value of K. And so given a central spin, that can be whatever because we have periodic boundary conditions, we pick a spin and uh, we take a chunk in the following way. We consider that spin and all the spins that are neighbors up to order k. k. So these three are the first, first neighbors, but second neighbors are this, um, this, that is length two, this, and so on and so forth. You can take the, the neighbors of order k. We use the Floyd algorithm to know what spins are those, because in the lattices, in this lattice is annoying. But you can pick them and just count the distances be between chunks of the system. And so you see the following. When you look at a little chunk taking k equal to 10, you are gathering basically 166 spins, doesn't matter, and you see this peak at high temperature. So this is in the disorder phase. Yes, actually the L1 distance that coincides with the Hamilton distance for this setup. But yes, exactly. We have many configurations. Each one of, uh, let me call it N of K spins, that depends on your K, and we compute all the distances that we have in our data set, and we make the histogram. And the important thing here is that, for example, if I take K equal to 14, then if I want to use the scale D equal to 50, then I will see exactly zero counts always, and so I can't say anything about the system. So actually these histograms tells you which is the scale at which you have to look at the system. It's not free to choose, basically. So what we do in order to be able to move K as we want, it's uh, defining RB to be the quintile of order alpha B, that means the point at which uh, the cumulative distribution function of this PDF reaches a value alpha B, which is arbitrary, and we take it more or less like a half or less. So a half is exactly at the peak and a bit less is a bit at the left. And we take RA to be just a fraction of RB. Again, this is arbitrary and a reasonable variance value seems to be uh, C equal to a half. You can move alpha B a little bit and C a little bit and you will get the same uh, results as we do. But these are reasonable parameters. Okay. Then, if you load the temperature a little bit, what you see is two peaks, because uh, near the transition, you start to see that the transition is uh, around 1.52. This is 1.5, so near the transition uh, from the left, that's the transition in the uh, thermodynamic limit. So, near the, the critical point, you start to see the two ground states, of the system, and so you get two peaks because you have the distances for the configurations that share the same magnetization, that is uh, low distances, so the left peak, and you also have the distances between uh, configurations that have the opposite magnetization, so th that gives you the high D peak. And eventually, if you lower the temperature more, you just see one peak because the simulation picks one, one ground state, breaking the, the symmetry spontaneously. And um, you only see one peak for low distances because the system is correlated 
and all the configurations share a similar magnetization at low temperature. So it is more or less ordered. Okay. Then what we do is a monitor our estimation of the intrinsic dimension that is, that is d hat normalized by the number of, of spins at the given k. We plot that versus temperature. And we see a minimum around the transition. And this has to be compared with this plot uh, done by Tiago Mendes Santos, uh, Marcelo Dal Monte, Alex Rodriguez, and collaborators in ICTP here. Um, in this case, they looked at the square lattice in, in the ferromagnetic case, but it's completely irrelevant the difference because the transition is the same for, two, for the two cases. And they see a minimum doing exactly the same, but computing the intrinsic dimension using 2NN, which is another estimator developed in the group of Alessandro, that actually is meant to work with continuous variables, but they use it nonetheless and to, to see what they get. And they get this, and we get this. So the nice thing here is that they did a thorough study of this minimum, how it moves when you increase the scale, the, the L, the number of spins of the system. And actually, they can, for example, with that scaling, differentiate between second order transitions, as this one, and, uh, for example, Beresinski cost early thoughtless transitions, that is the transition of the XY model in two dimensions. Doesn't matter if you don't know the name. But in that case, they also see a minimum. But actually, from the scaling of the minimum with the size, they can differentiate between the two scenarios. And what I want to say here is that actually, these two results, actually, it is well known that the hat and the intrinsic dimension computed with 2NN are lower bounds of the true D that you don't know. And we can see this uh, very evidently here because this is the normalized d hat. And in the paramagnetic phase, this number should be close to one, not exactly one, because there are correlations in the data, even in the paramagnetic, paramagnetic phase, but those correlations are exponentially de uh, decreasing with the distance between two, two spins. And so this should be close to one, something like 0.9, and it's 0, 0, 006. And for this case, uh, L squared is more or less to uh, 20,000. Yes? And actually, they get an ID that is 200. So it is, in fact, a lower bound. But what you can do here, actually, is do a scaling. And here we plot d hat squared versus the number of spins. That should be n of k, basically for different temperatures. And we see a perfect line asymptotically with the number of spins uh, for d squared. That means that d hat is basically the square root of n, uh, at least the, the, the scaling, right? And so this is very nice. And we see the same scaling using 2 nn. We checked. And we have analytical results using this framework that actually only with geometric arguments can give this, can predict that the estimator will give you actually the square root of what you want. But uh, those results are not yet a formal proof, so they are not here at the moment. But hopefully, hopefully they will be soon. But so, what is the problem? Why do we get the, the square root? The problem is that icing spins are discrete, yes, so it is good to use a discrete estimator, but they are not in z to the d. They are in 0, 1 to the d, actually. That means in the corners of, the, of a hypercube, a hypercube that doesn't have bulk, so all the spins are, in some sense, in the edge in this configuration space. That just fits in go. Let's mute. <laughs> uh, 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 uh. No, participants. Yes, question. Mute all. Otherwise, I continue. OK. Um, so I was saying, so we have to actually 
don't use volumes that are for uh, this setup because we are not in this setup. We have to use volumes for, for our setup, for icing spins. And so we define this. So having a configuration with only three spins or, or with L spins, doesn't matter, you can ask how is, how is the volume defined here? And we are going to say that the volume is the number of points in the set because it's discrete. And so given a configuration, whatever configuration, you can ask how many points are at distance zero in the space. And there are exactly one because you cannot do anything. It's the same configuration. At distance one, you have to flip one spin. That gives you humming distance one. And distance L, in general, um, the number of points at distance L. How did I? OK. Is a D binomial L, because you have to pick L places uh, in which to flip the spin. And so the volume will be the volume of a ball in this place using this metric will be the sum with L prime from 0 to L of this quantity. That gives you how many points are in a ball here with this metric. And so you can compute this and you can get another, uh, again, a hypertrigonometric function. That is this one, which is different from the, uh, from the Z to the D case, the arguments. And um, you get, again, this uh, binomial factor. And actually, you can make a normal approximation of this sum, if you think of it as um, the cumulative of a binomial with uh, p equal to half, then you can write this as a cumulative of a Gaussian. But it doesn't matter. The thing is that we have a nice analytical expressions to work with this uh, framework. And we can actually go again to the phase transition, exactly the same phase transition, but using this that we called the Hamming volumes. And actually, we see another shape for the transition. So this, this is the same. This is d hat normalized versus t. And we actually now see that in the disorder phase, this quantity is close to 1. And up to finite size effect, it doesn't matter if you take the k equal to 8, 10, to 11. All they give you more or less the same. And um, additionally, yes, sorry, I should have said, if they are all disordered, the intrinsic dimension, usually it's the number of parameters that you need to describe the system, the minimum amount. And at infinite temperature, they are all disordered. They are all independent. And so if you have n spins, you need n variables to uh, to describe the system. Moreover, if they are all independent, then um, they occupy, occupy all the space because there are no correlations, and then you need the full um, embedding dimension, which is n uh, for this system. So just as another remark, here we computed, I computed the um, standard deviation of the estimator taking a hundred realizations of the system in the following sense. So each time I take a realization, that means uh, I take 50 samples at random from the data set, and I compute my, my D. Then I do it again and again and again, a hundred times. And so for different number of samples, each time I get a value of sigma. And we see that actually sigma is uh, biggest exactly or around the um, critical temperature of the system, which is the expected behavior because the system has maximum fluctuations exactly there. So it is uh, the correct behavior that it should have. And I forgot to say that this step behavior, it's also, we claim, the correct behavior that the D should have because in the order phase, the system is highly correlated and uh, basically the intrinsic dimension it's like the opposite of correlations. When you have a low, cor low correlations, the intrinsic dimension is high. When you have high correlations, the intrinsic dimension is low. 
this is the step that you should, you should, you should see if you do things properly. If you see two gra the two ground states, then you need one parameter. If you only see one ground state, then you need zero parameters because you don't have a bit. You have just all zeros or all ones. Exactly. Okay. And here starts a, a section that I call the thin shells in the following sense. So the thing is that when D is large, when D is large, this implies, as we saw, as we saw, sorry, large distances. So, when you put more independent spins, the histograms move to higher distances. And so, <laughs> I saw you do it. What did you do? I think you should unmute there because that's that might be me here. I have to share again. I'm not able. I'm not able. Maybe you have to. Ah, this one. I think. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, the larger the intrinsic dimension, the larger the scale at which you have to look at the system. And actually, we have a, an hypothesis that says that the density should be constant in all our balls. But the balls are uh, larger and larger, so that the hypothesis might be compromised. So what we did here is uh, just taking, instead of balls, a will be just the set of configurations at Hamming distance exactly a radius Ra. So instead of a ball, A is just um, a surface. And B has to contain A by construction. So B, we take it to be the same surface and a little surface um, with a radius of Ra plus one. So if you do this, actually, you have to compute what I called P there. And uh, the good thing is that it simplifies immensely. So instead of hyper trigonometric functions and gammas and all that, you just get this, which is the scale over D plus one, the true D. And the fact that this quantity is trivially less than one tells you a nice thing that is that the scale at which you look at the system shouldn't be too big. Of course, we don't know D. We have to infer D. But this tells you that you shouldn't go too far with your radius in general. So using this, we can do maximum likelihood estimation again. And we have a different uh, equation for the D hat, which is just this one. So D hat is the scale at which you look, rescale by these quantities that you measure, okay, minus one. So it gives you this, and you can go and, and see what you get with, with this uh, little mod modification of the algorithm. And we did this actually for the ferromagnetic icing chain that it's not too different. So the main difference is that it's a one-dimensional system, but you just put the, the spins in a chain, and they are this time uh, coupled ferromagnetically because there is a minus, minus J and you, you can think of J being one. And so the spins like to be now parallel to its neighbors, but they are at finite temperature. And the good thing about this system is that it is uh, analytically solvable. You can compute exactly Z even for finite chains. So this is a nice model to test many things when you are learning how your algorithm behaves. So that's why we, we picked it. And uh, 
So this is the histogram of distances for this particular chain um, simulated with the, with the Metropolis algorithm again, as usual. And so for a 40 sites chain, we see uh, this. And I have to make the comment here about this in particular. So more or less behind 10 and above 30, we see mainly no, no counts. So we won't be able to say anything if we are um, to the left of 10, more or less, and to the right of 30. And so we can use this thin shells estimator again, against, in this case, to the scale for a given temperature, which in this case is just infinite. So we get a plateau at 40. And this is the correct, uh, the correct value that it should have. And actually, this is not a, a trivial result in the following sense. So this, the space of configurations have 2 to the 40 configurations. And we have 3,000 samples. And we can say that uh, our estimation is 40 uh, with confidence. So uh, this is actually a, a very nice result, having only 3,000 3, samples. We don't get the square root, we get the correct value. But this is for infinite temperature. When you put finite temperature, that means that the density is not constant in all this hypercube. So each point in the hypercube has a, um, it corresponds to a given configuration. Oof. Well, this one. And each point, it's a, for example, this one maybe the plus, plus, plus. This has energy minus three, right? So each point has a different energy. So each point has a different probability of being occupied. So, the, so there is a shape here, but in, in n dimensions. And so that induces that we don't see a plateau. We, for the moment, we are just seeing a local minimum. We see an asymmetry between short scales and large scales that is not that surprising if you use the result, the heuristics of the last, last slide. And uh, we are working in order to understand this plot exactly. For example, we don't know why all the curves cross at 20, but this is what we're doing now. And uh, the, the, the good thing to notice here is that below 10 and above 30, so th the curves gives you, for example, a value greater than 40 that makes no sense at all. So when the algorithm doesn't have counts, it gives you infinity, basically. Um, so this is the, the model validation again, taking the purple curve here around the minimum and here in this uh, completely wrong estimation, which is 10. The, the, the distance, the radius RB is 10. And so, if you put the radius to be 12, which is more or less in the minimum, you see an approximate agreement between the two cumulatives, the empirical and the, the one that follows our model. And in fact, if you put the radius to be smaller, then you see that always systematically, the binomial CDF is above the empirical CDF of the, of the counts in the, in the shell that I call A. Okay, oh, this is it. I'm not sure about the time, but we're okay. So the conclusions and perspectives are more or less this. So we are using, we, we saw how the binomial estimator works for data that can be continuous, can be discrete in Z to the D, or can be icing spins. You have to use a different metric each time. We saw how to use this to spot phase transitions on spin systems. What we are doing now, it's what we have to do now, it's to explain exactly why, why we see this behavior with the scale. We would also like to study the dependence with the length of the chain and also looking at chunks of the same length um, chain as we did with the, the, the honeycomb. What we can also do is brute force calculations for small chains 
in order to have the exact probabilities, all, the, all of them, in order to compute the expectation values analytically instead of measuring them to avoid any possible problem with the simulations. And what we would like to do after this is actually see if it's possible to take data that, is, that might be continuous, describe it in binary, so with spins, and then use this estimator to get the ID in the binary representation of the continuous data. This, if it's possible, would be very nice. And with this, I'm done. Okay, so thank you very much, Santiago, for the nice talk. Uh, are there any questions for Santiago? Yes. Thanks, it was very, very nice. Uh, I, I was surprised that with so few configurations of the spin system, you can estimate this non-trivial quantity so precisely. And what it makes me wonder is, uh, did you try the, to investigate the same kind of experiments in glassy systems uh, where uh, in spin glass phases, uh, it's, it's well known that it's very hard to estimate quantities like complexities, uh, counting, uh, uh, the number of uh, metastable states and this kind of things, and I wonder if this could be tried maybe maybe with a, a small number of uh, samples as well, you can estimate this kind of quantities or? That would be great. It's not uh, done yet because we are trying just to take the simplest possible cases in order to understand fully how the algorithm works. Once that's done, then we can uh, see more interesting systems. Of course, that would be okay. our so curious, you know, yeah. Um, I mean, a, a lot of realistic data doesn't binarize so well, right? Um, so I wonder if, would it be so hard to redo this with, instead of binary, instead of binarizing, but you give it four different values? Like you, you have a discretized spin. That would be more or less like a chunk of, of Z to the yeah. D, right? Yeah. That, that is okay, you can do that, but I, um, it might happen that you see the square root of the true D. So we would like to use spins because uh, we see the, the good number when we estimate on the known uh, case, right? Be because you, you have to know what volume to use, otherwise it's just a lower bound. That's the... The thing is that uh, the, the, the calculation that we have, it is, we have a, um, I have a scale argument to explain why you should get the same scaling um, as for icing spins. So if your system has four colors, four states, then one variable occupies a space that is not a, a full line, it's, it's just a, a chunk, right? So you have four states. And when you put uh, some variables, then you are forced to go to larger scales, right? As I showed. So when you put large scales to measure the system, then your four is the same as a one. Uh, so you get the icing scale. That makes any sense to you? N not entirely, but maybe we can talk about it sure. afterwards. Thank you for the great talk. So I was wondering, because as an example of a system that could be easily binarized, like typically with like neural uh, systems, you can say, okay, so a neuron is either active or it's not active, so you have a zero one. The problem with this type of network is that you don't really know the underlying structure, so you don't know which is neighbor of, of which. So do you have any idea on any possible extension of this method that could use, not like Euclidean space, but some type of, I don't know, like, network or like correlation distance to apply to this maybe like uh, more biological data that could still be binarized? I'm not sure if I understood, but the, the di your distance is between the physical realizations of the bits or, or is in the Hamming space, in the yeah. Hamming hypercube? Yeah, so that's the thing, like you can, 
sometimes what uh, what I have seen uh, done is since you don't have really like you don't know which uh, neuron is is neighbor of which, you can still like say okay, I'm gonna take a distance between neurons as like neurons be more more close to each other when they are more correlated. So, exactly. so you can take distance as a measure of like correlation, exactly. so to speak. Yes. And yeah, so I was wondering if you could maybe like somehow estimate a dimension of your neural manifold using, uh, I don't know, some variation of Might this. Might be, kind. yes, yes. Because that distance, it is more or less like the graph distance that you don't have in that, in that case, no? But the other distance that we use, so our metric with Hamming stuff, it is uh, for the configuration space. That is the same, no matter the graph of the physical realization of the bits, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. So I thank think you. It might work. Okay, cool. Okay, so if there are no further questions, let's thank Santiago once again. And <laughs>